Hey, and welcome back to part three of culinary identity. Let's transition here a little bit. Okay. Um, and this still kind of falls into the culinary identity. And what, well, is there anything else on the culinary identity that you want to kind of touch on? Because if not, I want to jump into talking prefix. Yeah, let's talk prefix. Okay. Right, I'm going to stop this real quick. Okay. <clears throat> Morris. Yes, sir. Let's talk prefix menus. Prefix menus. So, yes. <sighs> and this is something that in Europe, especially France, is <laughs> very common. Mm -hmm. Um. And here in the U.S., a prefix menu means two things. You're at a really fucking high-end place, mm -hmm. and it's just, this is their menu. Or you're a cheap asshole going around restaurant week. Uh, bitching that <laughs> I forgot about your iced tea week. isn't... Oh, shit. Your, your, your three-course prefix menu for... 30 bucks or whatever. And you're bitching that your iced tea isn't free. Yeah. Um, you're not ordering wine. You're not, you're, it's just, you're, you're part of what makes restaurant week an absolute fucking beating. Mm -hmm. Um, and God fucking restaurant weeks. I forgot all but about that. I love the concept of a prefix. Mm -hmm. Where it allows the restaurant to just show off, yeah, use what they have, and <laughs> it allows me to just sit down, not worry about anything, mm -hmm. just order a nice bottle of wine, and just enjoy the experience. Right. Enjoy the company. Take your phone, like put it away, mm -hmm. right? If you want to take pictures, fine, but don't be sitting there like ignoring everybody else at the table. Um, you know, that's, that's what I love about the prefix menu. Yep. Um, you know, it, regardless of how many courses it is, right. right? It doesn't have to be big. Um, when my wife and I were traveling through Europe or through France, you know, one thing I loved was there was a, um, a place where your your menu options was like the the three the five and the, like the chef experience right. right and but there was no this that or the other and the price point was incredibly affordable mm -hmm. and but the problem i see with the prefix here in the u.s is the guest. Yeah. Yeah. These guests that are coming into these restaurants are so fucking entitled. And the whole, I want it my way. You're here to serve me. Like, it's like, listen, take that fucking shitty ass mentality. Go to a fucking fast food chain. Right. Right that doesn't care about you, the food or its people. Right? Because your your attitude fits in perfectly with who they are. Right. But if you're wanting the experience, then welcome. Mm -hmm. Because the the beauty of a prefix menu is you really have to give all your trust over to the chef. But you have to just rely on yes. the fact that he knows what he's doing and he's going to take care of you no matter what your preconceptions or, or what you wanted when you walked in. But you're still going to get good food and you're going to get it at a good price. And I think you're right. The problem with the prefix is that like American people are very opinionated. And uh, I like my word <laughs> title better. <laughs> and... Um, you know, the, the idea of variety has been kind of instilled in us for a long time because uh, you can go to the grocery store and get anything you want. 
you know, the whole seasonality and the connection with food has been wiped away. So you, a lot of people don't want to go to a restaurant and not be able to order specifically what they want. And that's sad because you're missing out on a lot of, a lot of technique and a lot of creativity and a lot of love that goes into certain dishes. And I don't get those people that just like, they're like, I don't eat that. Well, that's why I'm saying, I mean, it's maybe the next revolution is, you know, that more, these smaller restaurants kind of focusing more on this prefix. Um, and Hey, Rich, if you're listening, start doing a prefix. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then the whole, like, Hey, if, if you want to be the one that wants to customize the shit out of stuff and you just want to go bitch because you're having a shitty day, um, or you want to sit down and make up some fucking fake food allergies just because you don't like them. Go somewhere, go to one of those big chain restaurants that doesn't care. Right. right? And if, if you care and you want to enjoy something um, that is a combination of sustenance and art. Mm -hmm. I like that tie in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right listen to that episode, mm -hmm. then then go find one of those restaurants from chefs and the team of chefs that do care. Mm -hmm. I think that is you're going to have an amazing experience. That relationship between chefs and guests is more in question now than it has been in the past where like a lot of these smaller restaurants and these chefs doesn't even have to be like a necessarily a prefix menu, but they are small menus so that they can focus more on the quality is that if you don't like my food, then what the fuck are you doing here? Don't come back. I don't care. Well, even then like these smaller restaurants and, and, and I hope I'm wrong and I'm general, general, generalizing, Wow, that was a hard word. This too much. But even those smaller restaurants, you'll see you're going to have, it's almost like a little checklist. You've got your salmon, your chicken, your your red meat, right? Maybe a pork mm -hmm. dish, uh, a vegetarian dish, which is going to be either risotto or pasta. Yeah, I did too. Right? <laughs> I, I mean... Unfortunately, but I mean, it's just a very generic, like, okay. I mean, in, but if you follow that pattern, you're not going to be wrong. Yeah. Now you're going to lose part of your soul, right? You're going to lose part of your identity. And by following that routine though, you're now forfeiting any creativity you wanted to be involved mm. with you're forfeiting the ability to then go to the, 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 your guest and say, this is what we're doing. You can't bitch about it. Mm -hmm. So you decided to start playing their game. So you're not allowed to bitch about not being able to play your game. Yeah. The burger too. Even though the, some of the most high end restaurants always have a burger on the menu and it could be the most crazy, insane burger ever would wag you beef and a fucking slice of foie gras on it and shit like that. But there will always be a burger because I mean, they're so yeah, like ubiquitous item. Well, I mean, you can be like uh, in New York, man. man uh, oh, wow. I'm going blank. Um, Minetta. Min Min oh my God. Why can I not think about this? About? It's just more of a famous burger. Um, I can't even spell what I'm trying to say. Minetta Tavern, M-I-N-E-T-T-A Tavern. It's an old ass restaurant, French bistro kind of place in, in New York. And they have a burger. It's a famous burger, but you can only get it at the bar. And I think they only produce like 20 a day. Mm -hmm. So in when it's gone, it's gone. No apologies. Like, mm, sorry. It's like, dude, we're, yeah, it's a great burger. Everything else here is great too. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, so we're, we're doing, um, God, I feel bad, man. I could not say that name. I've known this restaurant for fucking ever. I don't know why. I just went kind of blank there. Old. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> and I say that in the nicest possible oh, way. I felt it. I felt the love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll spoon <laughs> later. I'll make up for it. Oh, I'm not supposed to talk about that live. I, I don't mind. <laughs> Let it be known. Um. Oh man, hopefully our wives don't hear this. Mine will. She loves the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I have fans. Uh, well, at least there's one. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. What I mean. So there's we've talked prefix here we've talked the pros and the cons Mm -hmm. i i i voiced why i like it and why i i don't necessarily seen it happen and embraced as much as it should be um now i think rich at the heritage table could pull it off um and not in a restaurant week format Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because it also embraces the zero waste mentality. Yeah. Um, but so we, we've talked why we like it and what the problems with it is in a lot of the problems are really just the, the mm-hmm. guest, um, and unfortunately, having a, a new experience with it, not being able to choose and wanting to customize the fuck out of everything. Yeah. Um, can you, Yeah, I'll take that. But can I get this sauce on the side? I don't know if I like that. Put that on the side. Uh, <laughs> just fucking sit down and enjoy. Right? Chances are your life sucks. Stop trying to control everything and just enjoy something. It'll make your life better, I promise. When you get to that level of cooking... It- Everything that goes on the plate has, you know, meaning. It, it's it's to create the, yes. the harmony of the dish. You take one thing out of it, and now it's not the same thing. No. Uh. Uh-uh. Uh. Um. So th- the question then uh, is, what needs to happen, and what can people listening to this take away on? I mean. What would be the next steps in in helping open this up? Like, you know, right now we're producing, we're talking about all the problems, not offering any solution. Right. Right. So what what's the solution then? Um, we're for it. <laughs> I'm for it. You're yeah. for it. I think, I mean, people just need to be a little bit more open-minded and that's not a solution. <laughs> Um, and people need to be a little bit more concerned about where the food comes from, how it's prepared and where the actual waste from it is going. I'm going to kind of play devil's advocate for myself here real quick. What if the guest is a lot more willing to do this than we're giving them credit for? Uh, and now at this point, it's more of the fear on the chefs and the restaurants about doing something like this. I mean, this. that is also very possible. And it's instead of acknowledging that fear, we're going to blame it on the guest. Because not only is that more enjoyable, <laughs> it's, um, but it's a great distraction. Well, I mean, we're all... Uh everybody that's been in the restaurant has had to deal with that same problem. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a form of trauma. You don't just get over past trauma that easily. <laughs> we're, we're trauma brothers and you can, uh, you can want to put yourself out there as much as you want and you can try a little bit. But like you said, if you, 
if you're scared of what the guest thinks, then you have to have that checklist. But like I said, I think more and more chefs are steering away from that because the guests have been so wrong in the past. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, some of them know that. And that's why I think things will, are getting better. Or, but like I said, it's a long road. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know it's, what the solution it's would long... be other than I, I, think about it a little bit more. I, I've got the solution. Oh, come on. Stick your hopes and prayers up Aww. your ass, dude. Um. Well, I mean, not in the, I say that in the nicest possible way. Um, you know, thinking about it more is going to just delay and just now all of a sudden it's, it's dead. Like nothing's going to happen. Um, and I've gone completely blank on where I was going with this before I decided to be a deck. A dick Actually about speak it. louder than words. It's something mm -hmm. of that. Right. And just and, and, and do it because the other part is it we're not talking about ditching your entire fucking menu and just going exclusively to we're doing three or four dishes. Right. Right. You can grow into that. I think you would have to. You, you kind of have to establish a little bit of a reputation for yourself before you just open a restaurant and say we're prefix only unless you're in France. Who are even existing places, yeah. right? You can have your regular menu and then have another prefix menu. Um, and, and just, you know, I, and just have that be the, the thing. Um, the Zaitinia by Andreas, Jose oh, Andreas, right? That was one of my favorite right? meals. There's the one here in... There was they man, I would still wish yeah. it was here. Uh, absolute favorite restaurant. Um and every time my wife and I would go, um we would get their I guess it was a prefix. It was like the chef's tasting, and it wasn't like a big menu, it was actually just a line item on their regular menu, which was like six pages yeah. or something. It was, it was all kinds of just different things. And it was, I think. 50 bucks a person. It, it was yeah, pretty it was reasonable. Super cheap. Considering the amount of food yeah. you got. And it was high quality. And I mean, it was mm -hmm. phenomenal. Like, and so we never went there and actually went through the menu. We just sat down and said, yeah, we'll just do this. Um, and every time, like we'd be like, "Oh my God, please tell me we're almost done," <laughs> and it had, but in a good yeah. way, right? It was like we are stuffed. Um, and so I, you can do that, yeah, right. Everybody else can do that. Um, you know, so you don't have to get rid of your whole menu. Have the the prefix can, and the a la carte together mm -hmm. right and start see what kind of reaction you get really train your staff up to why this prefix is such an amazing mm -hmm. thing um where it's you know it's not the leftover special right. menu um but it's where the chefs and your team can really have fun with the creativity and it's really the purest form of what that restaurant is. And it's is. a great value. So, yeah. And, and so someone wants to go and they're just really looking to, you know, start with the fans of the restaurant, your regulars, the people that are coming there and be like, hey, you guys are going to mm -hmm. love this. Right. And start with them and then get them behind it. And then they can start bringing friends and talking about it. I think it can grow. Yes. So I, I think that's the solution. But first, we're going to have to start getting a lot more restaurants that are chef owner operators right. that have the, the willingness to want to put the effort into that level of creativity. Mm -hmm. 
because some chef owner operated restaurants, uh, the chef's just done. Uh, I mean, might as well have been me back there or Aww. something, right? You know, where I'm just like an old, bitter, <laughs> jaded, you know, you enjoy that way too much. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was a funny thing to say. Um, no, I, I'm I'm not old, bitter, jaded. Um, you know, there's been plenty of times I have been um, without the old part, mm-hmm. right? I'm not that old, but um, but man, where you can actually just get involved and have that creativity and just the community mindset of when you've got a great team that really is vested in it as well, and everybody's got just that think tank that starts mm-hmm. happening. Holy shit. It's a beautiful thing. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, when I was building restaurants in my mind, um, you just kind of my own pipe dream building restaurants. Um, you know, my wife and I early in our relationship, we're talking about it. It's like, Oh, we're going to win the lottery. And, we're going to go find this one perfect piece of property somewhere. And we're going to build this thing, destination restaurant. But I I mean, (laughs) whatever, but there was always one room. It was like a conference room that was a library and, you know, and just whiteboards. And that's just kind of where you would go to brainstorm menus. Um, I think uh, Le Bernardin has something like that, um, you know, and, but once again, it's going to require space to yeah. do that. Uh, and, uh, and square footage wise, if you've got space that isn't generating income, yeah, chances are it's not, it can be, be as simple as a big whiteboard in the kitchen and invite everybody, you know, the, the servers and managers and sure. it doesn't just have to be cooks. I mean, like if you have an idea, just jot it down. What harm can it do? Yeah. Well, I can tell you the harm it can do public embarrassment. I can already see it. Someone read something up there, you know, that they think's a good idea because the whole concept is, Hey, there's no such thing as a bad idea because there really isn't right. Because you don't know, where that idea can spur somebody else like in a different direction on something, Um, you know, and, but I can already see it in that somewhat of that community where we can, everybody can just write something down. Somebody walks up and looks at it and goes like, who the (laughs) fuck put that up there? (laughs) Now all of a sudden it's like, you know, you could see someone just shrinking down. Uh, You got to create a culture that doesn't do that kind of shit. Well, if it was pretty bad, I'd do that. <laughs> I mean, if it was pretty bad, I might do that too, but maybe maybe not out loud in front of everybody. <laughs> Did you write this down? <laughs> it's, it's stupid. <laughs> no, no, no. It depends on the on yeah, my day. Okay. All right, man. I, I think we're we're good on that. So, any other topic? I mean, we, we've kind of co- talked culinary identity, and we've spun this off into, uh, you know, the the bistronomy, um, the growth, some of the zero waste, and then uh, prefix, uh, and some great ideas there. Um, what what part of culinary identity have we not hit? Uh, I guess like individual chefs as, as opposed to like American identity as a whole. Well, if you have like, are we still recording? (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So um, like I told you about how I grew up. Right. And that, experience to Uh me seems almost like ubiquitously American. Like my friends all grew up the same way. We just, you know, our cultures or, you know, wherever we came from, it wasn't discussed. It wasn't acknowledged. You know, I didn't know I was Irish until I was in my twenties. But if you come from a background, whether it's 
I don't know, you're Mexican or you're French or you're even if you're Canadian. Like you have something to kind of fall back on. And I don't mean that in like a, any kind of negative way. It's just like when you're brought up with a cuisine, you have a lot of respect for that cuisine. Whereas a lot of us are blank slates. So as an American chef, uh, aligning yourself with a certain cuisine, it's, uh, I want to say it's difficult, but it's, 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 right. it's a big, I, it's I, a big choice. It. You know, you, you, you do what makes you feel good, obviously, but you know, it's, I don't know if it's harder or easier to be that blank slate. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because when you grow up with nothing more than burgers, pizza and mac and cheese, not saying that's what you grew no, up yeah, with, yeah. but just, I mean, just generalizing the whole concept of American food. Um, I mean, you don't really have an identity. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I know that's what you just said. I'm just mm -hmm. summarizing in my own mm -hmm. simple words because I'm You're more old. articulate than I am. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's true, but yeah, no, it's an interesting thought. I never really put that together because I mean, for me, it was California, growing up in California. And I didn't realize it at the time, but a lot of that really is stuck with me, right. though. Um, you know, some of the California cuisine and just more of the infusion of the Pacific Rim Asian mm -hmm. cultures. So, and that's still there. Um, now it's just infused with a little bit more barbecue. <laughs> I even remember when we were at Barley and you brought in artichokes for the first time and taught us how to turn artichokes. Mm -hmm. And you were like, in California, sometimes this is dinner, like just a roasted artichoke with some butter. And that was fucking crazy yeah. to me. I had never even seen an artichoke in real life. So it's not just, you know, cultural backgrounds from like other countries or, or whatever. I mean, it's also just your location within the country itself. I was born and raised in Texas, but what does Texas have? You know, Tex-Mex and barbecue? That's not the kind of food I cook. You have to make choices. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't really know what I'm trying to say. It's just an interesting thought when you don't have that cultural background to fall back on. Yeah. Yeah, because in California, there's a lot more farms that are smaller, local, um, just a ton more produce for obvious reasons. Um, yeah, Texas, it's not as much that. And then you get into the whole concept of identity of, like, say, chili. Does chili have beans? Does it not have beans? Maybe it's supposed to have pasta in it. <laughs> Serve it over spaghetti or cinnamon rolls. Did you say cinnamon rolls? Who the fuck puts chili Wisconsin? on cinnamon rolls? Wisconsin? That's yeah, a new they one. They put chili on cinnamon rolls. It's a thing. I, I, mean, I, I tried it see once. It. It's fucking weird. I'm not <laughs> disagreeing with that. Anyway, I don't know if we got on chili, but no, that's, yeah, finding your identity. It could be why so many American chefs growing up so quickly just try to latch on to something. Yeah. And I did, you know, we talked about that. It was really through like, I just wanted to escape the lack of culture and submerge myself in, in other cultures and it came out in my food and then my food became very disjointed. Because you're trying yeah. to find yourself. You're using the food as kind of yeah, that, that experiment. Who am I, daddy? It's a valid question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Papa, <son. laughs> 
I don't know how to further expound um, on that. It's just a weird idea. It is. But, I mean, very valid. Hmm. So if I open a restaurant, no matter what I make, is it New American? <laughs> <laughs> um well if you don't go into another category that is conveniently located in the check boxes in your Yelp page that wants to put a title to what you're doing, um, then yes, you're new American. Well, that sucks. Because you're only allowed to check one box. Yeah. To me it has kind of a negative connotation. Like it seems lazy. But I don't want to discount it altogether because some people might be really passionate about what new American cuisine is or isn't. Yeah, I, and I don't have another idea on that one. On what, because I understand the importance of being able to align, so to speak, with who you are. On when someone's searching for something, yeah, you know, like, hey, where are we going to go to eat? Um, you know, you don't want to end up place and show up somewhere and just be like, it's nothing but vegan curry, and you're like, huh, not <laughs> what I wanted right now. I mean, hopefully the name would have given it away, but I'm not judging yeah. anybody. Um, and. Yeah. And then, but if you check, if you were to check like French, then so many people would just be like, oh, it sounds fancy. Mm -hmm. um, even though you could just be like rustic country French. Yeah. Right. Um, but yet Italian is considered cheap. I think Italian's really having its moment in the sun again. Like these, uh, Med, med, well, the, real Italian well, or New York Italian? Italian. Italian. Okay. Uh, not too long ago, I think uh, Mexican cuisine was really being pushed into directions that people didn't know it could go. I think Italian, like quote unquote Mediterranean, is is the new boom in in restaurants. You see a lot of Mediterranean restaurants opening up. Let's uh, expound on that, to use one of your uh, bougie mm. words there. I have recently had this conversation with uh, a, a client that I've been working with on, mm -hmm. a, on a restaurant. And they, <laughs> they said with like Mediterranean <laughs> flair or influence on some things. And I'm like, okay, mm. let's talk about this real quick. The Mediterranean is huge. Yeah. It's roughly the size of the continental U.S. Right? right? It is not some, some small little lake, right? It, it is huge. In the amount of cultures, in <sighs> types of food that come from each region of it are vastly different. So when you, and then the other pro problem is when you say Mediterranean, the American mindset automatically goes to hummus. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, just a Greek, mm -hmm. a Greek restaurant, right? So it's not a Greek restaurant. It's in what people are trying to say when they're saying, you know, what this client was trying to infer was more of the Mediterranean diet, right. you know, fruits, nuts, vegetables you know, essentially cleaner, healthier. So and it was like, okay, you need to, we need to lose the, the word Mediterranean. Um, because I understand that's what you think, but people are going to go a very different yeah. direction with that. So, I, I mean, like I said, I mean, I, we had a restaurant that we were going to open with the, that group and they were calling it Mediterranean. And I was like, okay, let's talk about this. 
you know, does that mean, does that mean I can do, uh, you know, a hand, you know, uh, do a pasta out of Italy, but instead of using, you know, your typical garlic, onion, basil, you know, kind of base, so to speak, I'm going to bring in like, uh, like Ross Al Hadoot from cool. Morocco. Yeah. You know, um, you know, um, instead of like, uh, Mars Capone, we're going to be using, um, you know, right. The, <laughs> you know, it's like, where, where are we going with this? What, what do you mean by, um, and that's just me saying that like, it's kind of that bowling right. alley. All right. You know, saying Mediterranean is not identity. That's like saying new right. American. Like what the, what the fuck does that really mean? So that's my rant on Mediterranean. <laughs> Words have a lot of impact when it comes Meaning? to defining food. Yes. And people have so much preconceived right. ideas of what it should be based on their shitty experience yeah. somewhere. Or great. But they're automatically going to show up with a preconceived idea of what they can get. And that's, and that's it. it. Hey, chefs, appreciate you all listening to this week's episodes on culinary identity. Look forward to next week. Uh, next week, we've got talking um, situations that just about every chef has been faced with. Uh, I shouldn't say situations. It's one situation that every chef has been faced with. And if you haven't faced it yet, then it's just a matter of time. Uh, you're probably just too young. So uh, stay tuned for that one.